morning. What's going on, Finger Lakes? It's Friday, and that means it's time for a look at the weekly headlines here on FingerLakes1.com. That's the Debrief Podcast presented by FingerLakes1.com. I'm Josh Durso, and joined today, as always, by Jackie Augustine. Jackie, we're here. Wow. It's been a busy couple weeks here. It um, has. Yes, it has. Tons of news. How you been? I'm doing well. Yeah. How are you doing? Feeling I'm waiting for spring. That's yeah. Literally well, we had a little bit of it. spring, and then we... I know. Back in the deep freeze. Yes. <laughs> um, so lots of controversy in the last two weeks, lots of quick moving headlines. We yeah. have a state budget. Um, I guess let's let's get a quick, I know we planned on starting somewhere else, but let's get a quick, uh, over just a quick thought about the budget. It's done. It's over with state budget. What are your thoughts on it? Um, well, I mean, I'm glad it's done, right? Better that it be done than all these years when it just kind of lingered um, around. However, I heard a really interesting discussion, um, actually it's on Evan Dawson's show, uh, Connections, where he was talking about, you know, the well, he wasn't, but his guests were talking about the frustration with trying to parse out legislation that's tagged along with the budget so it becomes less a financial document more policy document Mm -hmm. um which is interesting because really a budget does set your priorities it communicates your priorities to the community to the to the public so um in that regard you know things like a plastic bag ban or something i mean those are policy (laughs) things that communicate to the public where you're headed but sometimes it's hard to tease out what the actual budgetary line items are are of most importance because they get kind of swallowed up in the in the other policy headlines. Yeah, and it begs that question, should the policy items even be included in what's supposed to be a financial document? Right. <laughs> for right. the state. And I mean I do agree that you want your budget to be a roadmap of what you care about and what you're investing in, but sometimes too much stuff gets tacked on. And like I said, then you never really get to see the meat and potatoes of the budget. And then I worry that things get lost in the shuffle. Yeah, and it definitely seems uh, like that probably did happen because there were, especially for, I'd say, the, the average uh, the average consumer who might not be totally in, in embedded in reading right. these headlines day after yeah. day and seeing how they shift day from day to day. Um, the plastic bag ban is now looks like it's going to be sort of expanding into restaurants or could be expanding right. into restaurants. So stuff like that kind of might get lost. Um, but first things first, we are talking today about leachate. Why are we talking about leachate? Um, because through a little bit of, I guess, investigative journalism or uh, attempts at investigative journalism, it seems pretty clear that uh, Casella has this plan to um, send their leachate from the Ontario County landfill by train, um, interestingly, which is made possible through some upgrades that were promoted by Ontario County last year in a rail corridor update and analysis study that the county funded um, and that Casella did not overtly participate in, but clearly Uh, was at the table for in some, maybe with a different hat on. And now they will be shipping, I guess if if the county approves it, they'll be shipping the leachate to some unsuspecting community in Ohio, which again is just another way of them keeping their costs down at somebody else's expense and allowing them to defer good waste management practices um, and really do some upgrades on the county landfill proper. So, you know, it allows them to just ignore some problems that they don't want to deal with and shift the burden to somebody else. And I, I find that wrong. Is what's the, the underlying concern, I guess, then? Because um, obviously there are going to be some people who hear that and say, well, great, it's not going to be here. Right. Not enough. our problem. Right. Yeah. Yes. It, it, what, what's the sort of underlying yeah. problem for residents of Ontario County? Um, to that end. Well, okay, the first problem, which actually has to do with what's currently on the table, is that anytime you allow a business to 
deal with a mounting issue, okay? What to do with the leachate has been a continuous problem for Casella. Again, read their online financial reports, which apparently the Board of Supervisors aren't aware exist. Um, they haven't spent any time with them. You go and talk to them, and basically their meetings are a cross between, I don't know, like Rotary and AA. Um, it's very difficult to get any kind of um, engage uh, governance response from them. So... Uh, they seem to be taken by surprise that leach that leachate is such a big problem for Casella and is uh, affecting their bottom line. So the county unwillingly uh, is facilitating them pushing that on down the line and you know increasing their profits. The that is a problem for us because that means that they're not going to be investing in the kind of on-site pretreatment, the other leachate measures that might reduce the smell at the landfill instead of being forced to invest in better technology and doing things better on site, they'll just ship the problem elsewhere uh, and call it a day. The bigger problem going forward is that Casella has a very big and very dangerous leachate problem um, in Shimung County. And I, you know, Peter Mantis has done an excellent job of following that. Um, but that leachate, which has started to test positive for uh, radium and potentially radon, so we, we have this radioactive leachate, right? And, of course, Casella will tell you it's still within acceptable limits, but let's just be honest. Um, when you're talking about things like this, similar to talking about lead exposure, it's a cumulative exposure, right? You, Sure, I might be able to come into contact with something radioactive for a moment and be okay, but it's cumulative exposure, which is what causes problems. So, so anyway, they've got this leachate. I imagine there aren't going to be a lot of municipal wastewater facilities in New York State that want to take that on. Um, but Certainly not Geneva, thank goodness. Uh, but anyway, now you're going to have this very convenient rail solution, uh, just a truck drive away. So I don't think it's completely far-fetched to think that Casella will truck that leachate that they have problems with up to Manchester or Shortsville, um, load it onto some rail cars, and send it to Ohio. And again, I do not think we should celebrate that that is becoming someone else's problem. I think we need to understand that that actually is a real problem for us that we should demand that they deal with themselves. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think part of the problem might be that, you know, there just isn't really a great way to deal with this stuff at all. As far as, you know, the things that I've read, the things that I've seen, you're still talking about, in this case, radioactive leachate, and there isn't really a great way to handle it. And I, I think it sort of gets back to the root of the problem, which is what we talked about a couple of weeks ago on this program, on Connections, when I was there talking about the digester mm -hmm. with Peter Mantius. You have to get to a place where better policies and better habits right. are preventing this type of waste to be created in the first place. Now, that said, um, I think it's kind of, an ironic twist that New York State, while continually appearing to up the ante in terms of what they expect um, or, or their expectations for how companies handle any kind of municipal yeah, waste, yeah, yeah. Um, while they're upping the ante, they're also saying, hey, companies, go ahead and ship it outside of New York State. That's cool. Right. And it's just, it's this bizarre, like, out of sight, out of mind approach, even at the highest level, at the state level, it's just like, it doesn't make sense. If yeah. you want to do something, or if you're going to come up with an effective, uh, you know, waste reduction plan, which I think is, is pretty much what the DEC is going to have to do to mm -hmm. start really addressing these issues at their core and at the root, instead of just dealing with all the, the results that, that are coming out afterward. Um, you know, I, I think seriously, that's the starting place. And to me, that's the most troubling part is like, well, we don't want this here, but we're cool that just being shipped somewhere else. Right. And, you know, that's not really a good plan, especially long term. Yeah. Maybe it's a short term solution because they have a better method of dealing with it. Um, that part hasn't really been talked about. Yeah. But if that were the case, I would also hope that, you know, companies in New York State or New York State would consider implementing those better 
uh, better methods right. here yeah. locally. Yeah. Um, yeah, I yeah. would love to say that really they've just found this supremely um, <laughs> advanced uh, wastewater treatment facility in Ohio that has all this technology we haven't thought of. I would love to say that's really why they're doing it. So, okay, let's be charitable and assume that's the solution. But, um, you know, it, this is just a another species of the same problem we're encountering. New York City doesn't have a good solid waste solution, so they send all their trash to us. We don't have a good solution for dealing with the leachate, so we're going to send it sub- somewhere else. Like, where does the buck stop? And I believe that you're right. The DEC needs to understand this. They are in over their head. It's very much like um, the FAA allowing Boeing to inspect their own jets, right? We see how that how that went. The idea is, if I think there are a ton of well-meaning DEC employees who want things to be done correctly and better than they are right now, but they are dealing with this problem of so much trash, so much leachate, what can they do but rely on the companies, SMI, Casella, to give them ideas about how to handle it? And that's the problem. That's why we locally, you know, everyday people have to more get more engaged about this because the DEC officials work for us. Like, we pay their salaries, right? They are state employees. That's paid with our state taxes. They should be protecting our interests instead of just making things as easy as possible for the private sector to dump on us. Yeah, it, it, yeah. That, and like I said, that it pretty much comes back to the, the planning aspect. I think local communities are kind of, um, they're kind of stuck. I, I'm not sure that, even with the the best of advocacy from Ontario County leaders or Seneca County leaders, I don't think you're going to sway the state one way or another. That's well, you know what though, I agree. I, I'm not trying to say that we could just immediately put a stop to things. But but here is something that could happen and, and this is why Ontario County is a different situation than Seneca County, right? Um Seneca County, they're trying to deal with a a private organization that owns its own land. And, you know, I mean, Seneca Meadows is its own entity. In Ontario County, that is our landfill. Ontario County residents own that landfill. And our supervisors are supposed to be the stewards of it. What they have done is just said, hey, I don't know anything about trash. Let's just get all the trash people to tell us what to do. And the fact that they don't understand how that is just a complete cop out and I mean it's it's totally an abdication of their responsibility. Let me put it in words they might understand, right? Um it it's quitting. Like they have just given over their responsibility to somebody else. It's ridiculous. And I think people are getting sick of it. You know, these guys, they want to go and they want to have their formal meeting and laugh and talk about whose birthday it is. Do they actually want to talk about what's going on in the county? Because not one committee gave a, like, detailed report about anything. If you went to those county meetings, you'd think there's nothing going on. And I think that's because there's not a lot going on with the supervisors, frankly. And we talk about it all the time. You need elected officials who are engaged, but you also need elected officials who, you know, are are interested in taking on some of the heavier topics, some of the things yeah. that can't just sort of be glossed over with a quick resolution. Right. Um, and, they need to actually want to do the job and not just get the title. I mean, these mm-hmm. guys clearly love the title, but that's got to come with some work. So uh, Geneva City Council has a vacancy. It still has a vacancy. Um, yes. Uh, where does that stand right now, um, and what is sort of the what is the next step in theory? Well, I don't know where it stands because, frankly, I went to the last council meeting. Every time I go to these council meetings, I hate to say it, but I get a little more discouraged. I'm not sure the city council knows what they're supposed to do. Um, I mean, they spent a lot of time talking about speed limit stuff that we've talked about it comes up every five or ten years and they have the exact same discussion and this time uh, the city attorney uh, 
was in audience and asked if he could just clarify what they can and can't do, which again is what many people, I mean, this council has many of the same members that have been there for a while. They seem not to have remembered that they had the same conversation just a couple of years ago. So they had it again. So the idea that they can handle the appointment of a vacancy or the filling of a vacancy, I guess, I guess my expectations are low, but that doesn't mean we should let them off the hook. The people of the sixth ward deserve representation. And um, it is, I think maybe they feel like they are honoring John Grieco's legacy by leaving the seat open. But here's the thing. You can respect John Grieco's service, uh, appreciate you know the work he did for the city, and still understand that there's no way John Grieco would have said, "Oh yeah, the sixth ward, you can you can forget about them for six months till your election, or not even six. I mean, more than six months, right? The election's yeah. not till November. Someone wouldn't take the seat till January. Yeah. So to me, it's a real slap in the face to not just the people of the sixth ward, but even to the legacy of John, that he was always trying to say, hey, someone pay attention to Ward 6. And the way they're going to honor him is to basically say, people of Ward 6, you don't really need a voice for another year. I mean, it's ridiculous. That should have been item number one. They should have at this meeting after with the proclamation honoring his service said and you know what here's how we're going to ensure that residents of ward six continue to have a voice on this on this body Mm -hmm. and instead not a word didn't even didn't even address it they didn't reference the city charter they didn't talk about new york state election law i mean maybe because they don't know it but that's no excuse like at some point across the board if you can tell i'm getting fed up with people saying, well, I don't know what we're supposed to do. Like, that's your job. It's your job to know, and then it is your job to do. So get going. I don't know. Sorry. Uh, I'm just, I, I just, I left that meeting Wednesday night, and I just thought, is there any group of elected officials in this area that's actually doing any work? I mean, the staff are, thank goodness. That's the only thing keeping things running. Whew. It, it, it's interesting, um, and I had seen surprisingly little coverage of in in Geneva from the Finger Lakes Times, and um, surprisingly little coverage on the the vacancy and and what the process was going to be, or what the the parties were going to do to sort of try and come up with candidates or or you know a a, a body to fill the seat right. until the election, right? Um, <sighs> Don't you think hand, that reveals? I'm uh, sorry. So, I, on one hand, I can understand the 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 idea of well, we don't want to make a decision on the voters' behalf, and if there is turmoil within any of the parties, and I'm not saying there is or isn't, I'm just, just taking a stab in the dark here. Um, if that's the case, and there's a little bit of uncertainty within those within that body that would be making the decision, um, maybe they feel it's safer to wait until election day and then to let the voters decide and then you don't have any uh you don't have any of the the damage on your on your watch um the flip side of it is i i completely agree with what you're saying you know uh folks need elected representatives and i I guess given that geneva has an at-large seat maybe maybe there's an idea that you know the at-large counselor would in some way shape or form represent them although i don't know that that's the intent of that type of um role no you held the you held yeah. the at large the yeah. at large seat i you know to me this is just another example of and I, i've sort of batted around the idea of of talking about this more but i think overall parties are pretty much failing at the local level elected party that your your party representatives they're failing people at the local level to the point where they're either serving as a roadblock for folks who want to get involved mm-hmm. or they're fumbling what should be fairly easy processes just to avoid what might be maybe a little bit of criticism along the way for making a decision god forbid i mean 
undoubtedly, no matter who they choose to be the next, to be that fill in until the election, you know, one, they're going to have an advantage. They would, in theory, have an advantage during the, the election cycle itself. I suppose, although I think that holds less locally. But Yeah, but then the other side of it is is you're, there are going to be people who are unhappy with the decision, no matter what. Of course. There are going to be people who Government. are unhappy come January 1st. Right, that's right. <laughs> so, you know, that, that part of it just, I, I, I understand, like, it's, it's clearly a calculation. Like, that decision is clearly a calculation. If, if the move is not to elect someone. It's the someone, calculation of cowards. I mean, that's the thing. Nobody says, no one should be involved in politics if their calculation is, this is going to make somebody mad. Like, hello, that is politics. I mean, you're not intending to make people mad, but if you think you can please everybody, you are better off being, um, you know, a sports coach than, well, no, they don't please any everybody anyway. I don't know. I, don't, I can't think of a role that pleases everybody. But, you know, th- the idea is, like, you, you don't belong in politics if you don't have the gumption to say, now here is what needs to happen next. And the thing is, here's the strange irony. John Grieco was appointed to city council to fill a vacancy. Mm -hmm. We have appointed councilors to fill vacancies during John Grieco's term several times. In every case, the argument was made, people deserve representation. But, and you mentioned that there's not a lot of coverage about this in the Finger Lakes Times. To me, that gets at the underlying issue. This is Ward 6. People don't care about the people in Ward 6. We've seen that when it comes to what people are notified of in terms of contamination. We have seen it, this in terms of what gets done, in terms of road improvements, what counts for the DRI. Here is another way in which council, and I'm not blaming the parties because I feel like ultimately it's a council decision. They better get to it. Council is telling people of the 6th Ward Sorry, that one person, one vote thing, mm-mm. We're gonna, just going to handle it. We'll let the at-large pick up the slack. That is ridiculous. And they wouldn't stand for it in Ward 3. They wouldn't stand for it in Ward 2. They wouldn't stand for it in Ward 1. But in Ward 6, uh, it's all right. And to me, that is a slap in the face to the thing John Grieco represented, which was don't forget about the sixth ward. I just find it frustrating. Yeah, and it's interesting. I, I wanted to sort of throw this up real quick just so people can see what we're talking about here. We're talking about Ward 6, which I, I threw a map up on oh, the okay. screen. For, okay. Describe to people where Ward 6 is for people who aren't from Geneva. Okay, so this would be um, Exchange Street North, um, going up toward like the deluxe, I'm trying to think of um, things that people would would uh, recognize as being Ward Six. Uh, the deluxe, Zotos, Guardian, uh, so the the industrial park, Courtyard Apartments, uh, Clark Street, and um, sort of the north side. Is that like yeah, the north side yeah, it's of the, the city? north side of the city, mm-hmm. and from kind of Genesee to the city line, to border city line. And um, just again and what's again. The, what's the reason? What, what, what do we think is the reason then for why this is, the, this is the sort of, is it because it's on the outskirts that it's not in that core downtown district that everybody seems to care most about? Or is there some other underlying? It's demographics. demographics. It's demographics. It is uh, lower income, higher rent, less white. And um, this is the problem. Um, I think a lot of counselors probably don't necessarily know a lot of people who live in the sixth ward, so they can't think of who they might appoint. And heaven forbid they should go out and talk to people, talk to the neighbors, and find out who are some community leaders. Uh, You've got a neighborhood association. Is anybody talking to them? The council should have said, here is how we are going to structure a process to find leadership for Ward 6. They haven't done it. So speaking of Geneva, we had gotten an email uh, a couple weeks ago after our last show 
um, from uh, Mike. It sounds like Mike lived in Geneva at one time. He, he wanted to know our thoughts and this sort of gave us a little bit of food for thought um, about the, the various efforts over the years to move the, the rail line Mm-hmm. out of the city itself, to pull it out and to, right. to put it elsewhere. He referenced an effort in the 60s, and I think there have been some disgust yeah. efforts over over the mm-hmm. years. Um, and, and even more recently, I think, was this something that came up during the DRI discussions, moving the one of the railways yeah, out? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it was proposed as like a DRI project. I mean, it Debated. wasn't. It wasn't. But but I think there was some discussion of whether or not you could work with Finger Lakes Railway to um, at least change the siding that they use along uh, 5 and 20 there and maybe direct trains um, westward a little bit more. Uh, I'm not... I. I am not part of those discussions, so I don't, I don't want to speak at a turn about things that I don't know about. But I think... From what I have heard, um, there were discussions that that actually, A, is feasible, Mm -hmm. and B, is something that um, has a lot of support for. I'm not sure what the logistical holdup is. I'm sure there's money involved. I'm sure that's part of the problem. Uh, But yeah, that would be be (laughs) great. And I think, you know, even um, not to keep talking about, uh, about... John Greco, I don't want mean to, you know, attribute to him positions, um, but I do know he had said on several occasions that it would be great to be able to get the train out of people's backyards along Andy's Avenue, right? right. And, um, uh, or I'm sorry, but Middle Street, but the Andy's Avenue backyards that that can see the lake when the trains aren't there. And I think that, um, you know, that has a lot of merit, but again... If you've got a council that's having trouble doing administrative tasks, you have a council that's going to have trouble with any larger project lifts. So I just want to hear. I want to throw the map back up. Okay, good. That we were just looking at, and um, oh, and now I can see it. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. That that rail line, I I think I'm not an engineer, but I think would have to go pretty drastically into Ward Six, just. Just that's my first thought. Like, given where it is, where it sits now, it seems like if you were going to relocate it, the only way it could possibly re- be relocated is if you were going, if you were taking it directly through a more. Well, it is full... in six right now, and there is another line that heads what I guess would be northwest. I think the question is more about diverting the traffic that way than on the the current. So my thought is after what you just said and after we just talked about right how is i mean this would probably raise some eyebrows like the, a move to put more trains in ward six would probably make some of the folks who live in ward six a little bit uncomfortable and a little bit annoyed with the fact that in some ways they're kind of well, just sort of being thrown to the side no i actually i think it's the opposite because really? the, the main issue that people have with the trains is if you look on the map there along um, the, along the lakefront, that rail, it's the stacking of the trains. It's the, um, it's the siding that is there. So the idea is that if you moved that siding somewhere just outside the city limits, mm-hmm. the, it's not so much that the trains coming through, the, the quantity would change. It's okay. that they wouldn't be sitting there and, you know, there's always, like, stuff <laughs> along the tracks yeah. that and people walk people cut across the tracks to get to the lakefront because there's no clear way to access the lakefront from ward six so i think people's complaint has been why do these trains have to sit here all the time when they're being moved about why can't that happen somewhere else so that the trains just pass through the city well and before the trains was that not were those not complete streets that came out further from the the city line or am i getting really well remember that used to be i mean the configuration of that whole area down there used to be different but yes the idea is that preemption street could go straight across but okay it doesn't because it would have to cross like four tracks so 
in other news, uh, we've got the uh, resolution in Seneca Falls that was defeated. Obviously, I'm not going to spend a lot of time right. sort of breaking this one down. Everyone's seen the stories. If you haven't, plenty of links on Finger Lakes 1. Check them out. Um, your reaction, I guess, is sort of the outsider. We've got two Seneca Falls stories. We're going to batch them together. Um, we'll talk about this, and then we'll talk about uh, former Village Mayor Brad Jones leaving the supervisor race. Okay. Um, but first things first, your reaction... Uh, not only to the resolution itself when it was introduced, but then also the, um, the 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 way that it was discussed at the meeting this past Tuesday. Well, I mean, I just saw it as a publicity stunt, really. And um, I guess maybe someone would say that no publicity is bad publicity, but oh, this is bad publicity. It was it was bad. <laughs> this was bad publicity. Um, <laughs> Because, well, I don't know. I mean, my grandfather was a World War II vet and always said to me that um, people's ability to speak their mind was one of the fundamental things that that was worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea that... Uh, I mean, so so to that regard, I guess Supervisor Lazaro has a right to speak his mind. But the the point is that he's trying to punish um, an organization for recognizing somebody who spoke their mind, and that just it. I don't. I don't know. I, I don't. So one, the the resolution in my mind didn't hold any water because the town hasn't given any right. funds to the hall since 2010 and when they did it was effectively it was just a 10 percent match on a grant um a two million dollar grant that was ultimately turned into an eight million dollar investment on the town's behalf so right. for the town's benefit yeah that's why i'm saying it that's, was a stunt it was we're and, gonna, we're gonna stop doing something we're not even doing right and, and i think it sort of played on the fear that people's tax money here in seneca falls is being spent unwisely right and while i believe that is the case this is not one of the areas <laughs> where it's being spent unwisely right. it literally just isn't being spent it hasn't been budgeted in years and frankly given the finances of the, the town right now i don't even think the board would consider making such a donation um, or such a match present day. Mm -hmm. That said, uh, I, I think it kind of, I guess if there were something that I didn't get to talk about, like throughout the whole, the process of covering it um, and, and sort of providing a little bit of analysis along the way was that it, it took a, a group of people, vets in Seneca Falls and in surrounding communities, and it attempted to, the, the resolution attempted to use them for political gain. Yes. And that should be a concern. Mm -hmm. um, you can, t you know, Supervisor Lazaro is a regular as far as talking about what, what philosophy means and his, his philosophy of governing. And it, he spoke to it a little bit. He tried to, to paint that sort of line in the sand where this is, you know, we just can't do it. We have to make this. We have to make this point and we have to stand our ground. But this is not one of those things that is worth present day standing your ground over. If you want to advocate for vets, right. advocate for them on all of the other areas where they're they're not getting their fair share. Yeah. How about health care? How about VA issues? How about mental saying, health? We're going to take a stand. Housing. Right. You name it. Like right. workforce, you name it. They are not uh, they are not on a level playing field with everybody else when yep. they when they return from their service, and that's to me that was the thing that was sort of lost. And it was clear, mm -hmm. you know, if there were anything that was very clear, sitting through that meeting and listening to the vets who did speak, <clears throat> you could see that they were they were folks who uh, historically have gotten the short end of the stick. Yeah, and this was sort of playing on on that tragedy and. That, to me, is just, that's not good governing. That's not anything. It's right. just, that is it's grandstanding. Mm -hmm. That's probably the best the best thing you could say about it. Um, and that's not a best. It's a worst. Uh, but the other bit of news from the last uh, couple of weeks, obviously, uh, former Village Mayor Brad Jones is out of the race for uh, town supervisor. Um, that leaves two individuals, uh, Doug Avery, who serves on the board now, Mike Ferrara, 
um, who was pe- circulating petitions and presumably would be on the uh, on the ballot as a Republican come November. Um, no other names have been circulated for that town supervisor spot. Supervisor Lazaro did not get his uh, did not get endorsed for his second term. So there was that that ship has sailed. So what is your reaction, I guess, as an outsider to the news that that uh, former Mayor Jones is out? And that is where we stand right now in this race, which seems like it will once again, um, at least from my perspective, be solely about the landfill and not not much else, unfortunately. Well, I mean, I thought I think it's unfortunate that he's out of the race, but I did think that his um, his statement about why he was leaving does tell a lot about what's going on in Seneca Falls. I mean, it's true And I think, unfortunately, we're going to see this in the Geneva election as well. Um, If you're getting a group of candidates who are interested in a popularity contest, and I'm not saying this about any particular candidate in the Seneca Falls race right now, but I I do understand that if you look around you at, at who your running mates might be and you say, wait a second, People are not serious about solving problems. They're not serious about doing work. They want to get in there because they want the title, because they want to say that they're doing it, because maybe it comes with some small paycheck. I don't even understand that. But um, it is demoralizing. I can understand him saying, as I look around, I'm not seeing running mates who want to step forward and solve problems. And that does not bode well for the livelihood of all of us who have to live in these communities and be governed by people who aren't going to take the work seriously. Um, And like I said, I worry about that in Geneva also. I'm hearing, and I don't mean to pick on the Republicans, but I do. Um, I'm hearing some of the names that are being circulated, and I'm just thinking, okay, all right, we are about to get into an interesting environment where where there's no institutional memory, um, there there's no understanding of just basic operations. Uh, there's no you know a, active civic engagement leading up to this run. It's like those are the candidates that that puzzle me the most. Yeah. The ones who literally just come out of left field. You've never heard of them before. Right. A lot of people wouldn't know them if they encountered them right. on the street. Right. I think it's one of the big things that you know. Some people harness really well in local elections where they use that name recognition and that face recognition to get through elections when maybe their policy isn't as strong. But then other times you see people enter races and it's like, did you think about what would be necessary in terms of just letting people know who you are before you said, hey, I'm running? Right. And you know, that's the in full disclosure, right? Bad strategy, I guess. I think people could make a criticism. Um, about my initial foray into public office that I kind of came out of nowhere. And I would say that's true. However, I was attending meetings and speaking at meetings and thought things didn't seem right. And then I was approached about running. And I thought, well, okay, I'll run as like a third-party candidate so I can go to the debates and at least ask questions, make sure the stuff gets talked about. Did not intend to win. But that is the thing. At least, like, I'm not even hearing from some of the people circulating petitions even a a modicum of understanding about stuff. And the problem is they all say that they're being prepped by some of the previous counselors. And I'm thinking, oh, man, oh, boy. Like, this is... We are headed for interesting territory. So I think the same thing's going to happen in Seneca Falls, unfortunately. I mean, um, you know, Brad brought a lot to the table in terms of, like I said, these things like institutional memory and um, understanding of policies and the financial situation in a more broad sense than just the landfill. And if he feels like the field, the the candidates for town board... um, not necessarily for town supervisor, but for town, for town board are lacking in those ways. Yeah, that does make me nervous. Yeah, and obviously two big elections coming up. Clearly this year's big and the next year's big mm-hmm. for obvious reasons. Right. Um, but we did get a little bit of new information in terms of what one of the races next year might look like. 
Um, we know uh, Congressman Reed is going to see a challenge. Right. Um, but now we also see that uh, Representative Keiko, he is also going to see a challenge. Uh, Roger Misso, a Red Creek native who flew combat missions as a U.S. Navy pilot, uh, is the first Democrat to enter the uh, 24th congressional race. Um, he announced Thursday that his campaign committee had been formed. That means the money will begin flowing in and the whole process will get underway for him. Um, this, of course, is interesting because it's a seat that's that's flipped. Um, it's notorious for flipping. There were obviously some some concerns this most recently uh, this most recent election for um, Catco when he was uh, challenged by Dana Balter mm -hmm. that because of the money she raised that he was he was beatable. Um, yes. Doesn't change the the makeup of the district, which includes Syracuse and and sort of that Cuga Wayne County. It's it's a it's actually a pretty good hybrid of urban and rural right. together, um, which I don't always think happens in a lot of districts. Mm -hmm. So uh, you do see a little more sort of back and forth. And in a lot of ways, um, you know, Representative Kako has been viewed as sort of the moderate, uh, the moderate Republican representative. Right. So this will be an interesting race, and I will be very interested to see what um, role. Uh, Roger Misso's service actually plays in the whole the whole race because I think that's something that you know we've seen in recent elections more on the Republican side than on the Democratic side. Um, it works. It's it, it works. It gets people engaged. It gets them interested. They feel that that tie to the candidate because of their service, right. and all of a sudden, it's a it's another factor. Yeah, I think, you know, Representative Katko has been viewed as a moderate Republican, and I think that he's been forced to be because if he's going to be um, a legitimate representative of his district, uh, he needs to understand that a lot of the Republican policies work directly against his constituents' interests, and he has been able to say that. I give him credit for that. Uh, Tom Reed's not been able to do that. Um, you know, Representative Katko has been able to say, wait a second, like this, this actually will hurt people. And Tom Reed is still kind of living in his own bubble where things, things will be great and fine and everything's wonderful in the 23rd and it's not. <laughs> so, um, so I think that in that respect, you know, of all the people to be challenged, um, I, I, I wish this challenger well because I do think that by and large the the Republican agenda is very bad for more rural communities um, and you know in, in terms of their economic interests so that'll be good but uh, to yeah, be I, fair just to sort of push back against that a little bit I'm not sure either party's uh, overall agenda is very good for rural um, rural America. I, I don't see Democrats doing anything, going very far out of their way, um, with exception of some state initiatives, which have just meant economic development funding. I don't see that. I don't see where either party is really going above and beyond for that ninety-seven percent of of folks yeah, who live no, in those I, rural I, districts. I agree that not enough is being done, but I mean, just like this health care, this new renewed attack on health care. Like, look at let's look at who has the least access to health care and who is going to be hurt the most because they are they work for employers for which no plan is provided. And if you look at the the makeup of our districts, you know, b both of these districts, um, the access to affordable health care, not that the current plan we have is perfect or even great, right? Yeah. But um, but the idea that we have a lot of people who will be left with nothing if that is taken away. And you've got to be willing to say, okay, I understand this is the party line, but look it, I've got thousands of people who depend on this. Yeah, so obviously one of the things that I wanted to talk about is uh, – national piece of legislation that I thought was interesting. Uh, so a Senate panel this week advanced legislation that would levy a hefty fine on illegal robocalls. Yeah, you know, those those calls that okay. seem to never, yeah. ever, ever mm -hmm. end. Obviously, a lot of people want to see the phone company, the telecommunication companies crack down on who are ultimately allowing, you know, the Verizons, the AT&Ts, they're allowing this to happen. Right. Um, 
already today I've gotten six. Oh it's, boy. It's it's nine twenty four. Um, everybody gets them. Yep. You can't stop them. Thankfully, my phone has this awesome feature where I can screen the call, and that takes care of the problem where I don't have to deal with it. Um, but this is one of those things that's like this is big and it's important because. Mm-hmm. While some of the robocalls are just annoying, some of them are also legitimate spam, intrusive, oh yeah, illegal, like seeking to do things that are not good yep. Yep. for the the consumer. Um, it's one of those things though that's just viewed as annoying. So I don't think it gets yeah. the attention that it necessarily should. But how often? I the reason why I wanted to talk about it is because I'm constantly seeing press releases from the sheriff's offices in the area warning elderly people particularly to watch out for these phone scams which Mm -hmm. harness the same kind of the same kind of um they're going through the same avenue yep so i think this is one of those areas where yes it's annoying but let's forget about how annoying it is and let's talk about and find a way to actually stop the the bad thing from happening in the first place right yeah i mean rant unless you if most businesses uh, operate purely out of a profit motive, if it continues to be profitable for them to allow this to happen, it's going to keep happening. So if the way to diminish the profit motive is to assess a fine or a penalty for this happening, then yes, that's the way to solve it. Um, It's unfortunate we can't just appeal to people's better nature and say, hey, Uh, This is taking advantage of people who might think it's a legitimate call, might get themselves into trouble going along with it. Uh, Nope, nope. You know, we started the show talking about this stuff, and I guess we'll end the show talking about this. Um, Corporate interests are going to get away with as much as we let them get away with. So, yes, I think this is another case where we need government intervention to rein in this desire to just make a buck at anyone's expense. And we've got a couple extra minutes, so I want to throw a couple uh, state topics that we were we were going to talk about if we had time. Um, plastic bag ban. Mm-hmm. It's happening. It's yes. real. Might be expanded, but it's real. Um, right. What have you heard from different people as you've been just sort of going through your day-to-day life since the budget was adopted and alt- or the budget was passed and we ultimately found out that the plastic bag ban was going to be real? Um, I haven't really heard a lot about it. I mean, I haven't, I don't know that it is a primary topic of conversation in the circles I'm in, I guess. Um, I, I think that anyone who drives past the Ontario County landfill and sees all the bags up against the fence is glad that, that there will be fewer of them. Um, I think people who use the bags to line their bathroom trash cans or to clean the cat box are going to have to find a slightly different solution. But overall, I'm not sure this is the kind of thing that um, impacts our lives to a great extent. It's interesting because it's super, super... It, I'm I'm taking a step outside of that circle and I'm saying it's interesting because it seems like those are the two... Like, you're either very, very offended by the whole thing right. or you're just like whatever it doesn't matter and I, I think that kind of points to the the maybe there's a, a socioeconomic factor at play there maybe there is some other factor at play there I don't know um, but it does seem like there are a lot of there's a lot of resentment towards this idea and I'll be very curious to see how well it's implemented over the next year because effectively yeah. it takes place March 1st 2020 that said um, I'll be very interested to see if if we get some of the uh, some of the grocery stores just jumping on board early, just yeah. like ripping the bandaid off real fast to just get it over with. Well, they've got to get rid of whatever their inventory is, I suppose. But but yes, I hope they're making a, a quick transition. I don't know. I just feel like this is another one of those situations where people get upset about it because they say, "But I want, I want it. I want a plastic bag. I want that convenience." And I'm thinking, okay, I mean, isn't that the problem with our culture? We want whatever we want as soon as we want it. And, I mean, this is it's the same thing, right? 
Casella wants to track their leachate because they want to, because it works for them. It's convenient. It's easy. They don't have to think about it. Well, you know what? Maybe it's bad for everybody. Maybe you can't do exactly what you want to do all the time because mm-hmm. there are other people in the world that need to coexist with you. Like maybe, maybe it's the same thing I tell my kids, although my kids are pretty good about this. They know that I want this is not a good argument. But, you know, when they were little, they, you get that a lot. But I want it. I want to eat candy all the time. I want to do that. Well, you know, you got to tell people sometimes, I'm sorry. The world doesn't work that way. It's not all about you. So then also we've got the mugshot ban, which has taken place. State police will not be releasing mugshots moving forward. County and, and city and town and village agencies, I guess, will be left to sort of make their own decision based on what the legislation says yeah, at this point, even though nobody really seems totally sure of what that legislation is, even though it's been adopted and it's done. Right. Um, Brian Kolb's going to be uh, our Sunday conversation this week. I, I will be talking with him later today, and I hope to Great. get a better sense of yeah. <laughs> what this yeah. what this actually means, um, because I'm not crazy about putting local officials, local cops on the front line and making them make the decision. If the state is is feeling so confident that banning mugshots is a good idea, own it from top to bottom. Right. Don't put it on city officials, town officials, village officials who are all dealing with completely different circumstances. Like they're all dealing with completely different demographics of folks who live in their communities. So a decision in one place while it's going to be viewed as as equal to a decision in another place, it really won't be because of the differences in those communities. Yeah, I mean, when we talked about this before... Arrest records I, not included, right? thankfully. I thought it made sense to parse it out by type of offense, right? By the thing you're charged with. Like if somebody is charged with um, suspected, you know, they're suspected of kidnapping, yeah, you should put their picture out so that other people can can see that. If someone is, you know, accused of, um, you know, sexual assault, you put that picture out, a lot of times other people come forward. But instead they parse it out by jurisdiction, which makes no sense unless, unless, as you said, you were right. The real motivation behind this was in the wake of these statewide corruption probes, some of these well-to-do people didn't want their pictures in the paper when they were charged with corruption. And who would be charging them? The state police. So now the ban is on the state police, but nobody else? I mean, that is just like saying, you're right, this was to protect the wealthy. We have passed a law to protect the wealthy, well-connected people who don't want to be embarrassed when they do something wrong. And that, I agree with you, is totally the wrong way to handle it. And the the travesty of it all is that this is masked as as a solution to a problem where folks in in urban places, Rochester, Syracuse, say that this is unfairly affecting a, a minority group. And it's like... If maybe, you know, yes, that probably is the case. I I don't know what the numbers look like, but just to actually sort of compare that to what the reality of this law is, I mean, there is no saying that the city of Rochester or the city of Syracuse have to have to abide by it. And that's the that's the the laughable part is it's masked as this great this great thing, but it's not. (laughs) Like when Victor, you know, when a couple of um college students or high school girls steal some stuff from the mall, I bet we're not going to see their faces. Um, But, you know, if somebody um, who's not white uh, leaves with a bag of groceries from Walmart, we might see their face. I mean, I thought that was the problem that was trying to be solved. Well, And instead... Uh, nope, it's really just about um, people like Prococo and these other guys. Let's not put their face on the TV screen. Let me put some context on this because I get press releases from law enforcement agencies every day of the year mm-hmm. and have for the last four. Um, Ontario County, unless it is a serious felony case, basically does not release the uh, mugshot unless – it is sought out by the the agency, by the actual like news organization. Um, the the city of Canandaigua doesn't seem to release any photos unless it's a felony, a felony charge. Um, 
and they don't even sort of release the the misdemeanor arrests in real time like a lot of other police agencies do. They do like the the semi weekly recap kind of thing okay. where you get bullet point lists. Um, and a lot of other agencies do the same thing. Cuga County doesn't send out uh, mug shots very often. Wayne County doesn't do it very often. The Seneca Falls Police Department does and doesn't. They're in and out. Seneca County, same thing. You have to seek it out. It isn't just sent out by default. This stuff is not, I think this is more of an urban problem than it is a rural problem. Um, but in these rural communities, especially when you're talking about these um, instances of accused uh, sexual assault or anything else where you are talking about there could be other victims. Right. That is probably the biggest issue in my mind. And this legislation seems like a beginning, not an end. I right. think arrest mm-hmm. records are next. I think by next year, uh, the governor will have enough um, will have enough going on this to kill uh, arrest records. And that will really that will really start a chain of reaction that I'm not I'm not entirely sure I can't sum it up in a couple minutes hmm. but that'll be that'll be big. Um, are you watching any story? What stories are you watching uh, this week heading into next? I got one that I'm watching that is just to me pretty interesting. The, the story I don't know if you've heard about it or not. The the closure of the Phelps Hotel. Oh yeah, and yeah. and to me is Trying just to figure out. Fascinating. Is it closed, then? It's closed. Like, There's two large, good? confirmed it with my own eyeballs, two large for sale <laughs> signs um, right on the building. Um, there is some sort of note attached to the front door as well. I didn't look at the note, but it's just unfortunate to see one of those. You know, I've probably in my lifetime only been there maybe a half dozen times, mm-hmm. um, but it's just one of those staples. And right. I think it's really reflective of these small rural communities sort of. Going through a transition in a lot of ways, this is where folks get that ammo where they say, well, see, our community's dying. Mm. Where these institutions don't right. get their proper, even if they have to close for completely legitimate reason, right. they don't get their proper farewell and they just sort of close under the radar, they disappear, and it's like that history is lost. Right, right. Well, I mean, I guess the thing I'm watching is... Um, whatever's going on with the Ontario County Humane Society, because this keeps coming up at City Council. This, so City Council sent a letter saying, hey, we're not getting our money's worth. Like, what's going on here? This has been ongoing for like three or four months, yes, I think. Yes, yes. Yeah. And then I guess some of the Ontario County uh, Humane Society board members called individual counselors, a couple counselors, usual suspects right said oh my goodness well someone says that we did something wrong we weren't even paying attention we just kind of signed off on this thing we weren't paying attention but they didn't try to get and go back and check the information they just then took someone's word for it and said we got to rescind this letter and now and then three people resign and i'm thinking wait a second there's clearly more to this story than is getting out because, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to even speculate, but let me just say it's unusual for things to go this way if there isn't more to the story, I guess would, would be the way I would say it. Yeah. So I'm hoping somebody's taking a look at that, but who? I mean, who? It, it, Ken Camera tried to get city council to reinstate their letter and say, look it, obviously we raised some legitimate concerns and they're not having that. I don't know who's actually running this show in terms of looking at what's going on because it doesn't feel like the Ontario County Board of Supervisors does any critical analysis of anything. So I don't know, our tax dollars, disappearing i'm not really sure what they're going toward and this is one of those that's one of those ones that has been getting a lot of traction on social media yeah people people are really passionate about their animals sure and when you involve animals it it because it's almost like a different level of even people right and it that it's been interesting to watch that one sort of evolve over the last several months maybe at our next show we'll actually do sort of a a recap of what the headlines have been (coughs) and where we stand at that point in a couple weeks Um, and sort of look at maybe where Ontario County could go. Yes. If they were being proactive and doing things right. Mm Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> at any rate that's our show for today we will be back in a couple weeks i will be back next week with another episode until then fingerlakes1.com latest headlines download the app we'll see you next week <laughs>